Could two buildings be more different in concept and vision? Whitman College, Princeton's first modern four-year dormitory, is constructed in the traditional Gothic style. Meg Whitman, the former CEO of eBay, the online auction giant, gave $30 million to the university for the $136 million project. It was designed by Dmitry Porfirios, who is unapologetic for his traditional approach to architecture. I'm interested in doing Gothic buildings which are robust, meaning that they will have a longevity of life. So the external wall has to be properly constructed in stone, which is bonded with a brick support behind it, etc., etc. And it should be a wall structure which will have to have at least a lifespan of about 200, 250 years. Far from traditional, the Lewis Science Library, which also houses the Princeton Institute for Computational Science, is unlike any building you've ever seen before. New in its architectural forms, new in its methods of construction. The project cost over $74 million. Designed by the famous and controversial architect Frank Geary, the building was primarily funded by a $60 million gift from Peter Lewis the highly creative former CEO of Progressive Insurance. Peter makes no bones about his belief that Princeton also needs architecture that looks to the future. Frank, in my view, is the first great architect of the 21st century, probably more than the greatest architect of the 20th century, although he might be that as well. Whether history validates my view remains to be seen. No architect, no builder is addressing the future any more than Frank is today. I think we have two kind of unwritten rules, but one of them is if it looks anything like something anybody else has done, no. And the second rule is if it looks anything like anything we've done, no. Two buildings, two very different visions. Much of the story of Whitman College is a story of stone. Finding stone, cutting stone, finding ways to support the weight of stone, and finding craftsmen who have the skills to construct stone buildings with techniques no longer in general use. The field stone, the blue stone, each piece was handled, people estimate, roughly eight to nine times, from the time it came out of the quarry to the time it got put through the original guillotine, placed in a pallet, shipped to the site, and then picked up, chipped away piece by piece by the masons, up to 77 stone masons at one point in time with 30 laborers assisting them. The limestone is saw cut or hand chiseled to a particular location on the buildings. If you looked around the site, you'll see many of those pieces of limestone sitting on pallets. They all have numbers on the bottom of them because they all have a precise location on the building. The field stone was about 5,000 tons, somewhere around 175,000 pieces individually cut on site. The limestone was approximately 2,500 tons, somewhere around 38 to 40,000 pieces of limestone. Much of Dimitri's work was devoted to the site plan and the creation of courtyards. One of the interesting refinements, which he borrowed from Ralph Adam Cram's graduate college, is that the courtyards are not exactly square, but just one or two degrees off a right angle. Most visitors probably aren't conscious of this difference, but it makes the experience of the courtyards mysteriously fascinating. You come up to the building and you just sort of step back and say, wow. Interestingly, it may sound simplistic, but I did it because it gave another 125 kids a year a chance to go to Princeton, beginning, middle, and end of story. Because I am so fond of this place, I adored my time here and I want other people to have that same opportunity. We've taken up the challenge of how you can actually work within contemporary industrial production and at the same time give the sense of tactile personality to a building. So the materials that we use are always what I call natural materials, materials which are not gone through an industrial production of manufacture that does not project the coldness of industrial production, but it actually presents a more kind of humane face 
something that you can actually touch, a building that you would love to actually touch, a building that you would love to kind of lean against in order to talk with a friend or whatever. You might have heard a funny story. There was a summer executive program here, and they were watching the finishing touches being put on Whitman College this summer. And one of the groups said to one of the faculty members at Princeton, boy, when Princeton renovates a building, they really go to it. They thought this had been here for 100 years. While the plans for Whitman College were moving forward, the impossible occurred. Princeton decided that Frank Geary, who had been rejected in the past, could design a building for the campus after all. Harold Shapiro was retiring as president, and there was a dinner over at Forbes College. Harold takes me to the corner, and he says, we can get a Gary building on campus. I said, Harold, there's no way. And he said, oh yes, we can. And he said, we have a need. We have to build a science library. We have a wonderful site for it. The budget's $60 million. Jerry, the provost, and I got it all figured out. And we think it would be a great spot to have a Gary building on the campus. I said something like, Harold, I don't think it's possible, but if you can get it done, I'll pay for it. Created with 88,000 pounds of stainless steel from Sweden, 400 tons of structural steel, 35,000 square feet of Canadian clay brick, and almost 25,000 square feet of glass, the design of Lewis Library push the limits of construction complexity. Why these shapes? Why do you twist and turn like that? Why would anybody do that? It has to do with my belief that a building can have feeling, that there can be buildings that are deadly inert and don't give you anything. And I think my favorite buildings feel the Lewis Science Library represents an attempt to rethink what a library does in 21st century terms. The really intriguing, interesting ideas in science increasingly are happening at the boundaries between sciences. Fields like biophysics, fields like geochemistry. These are fields that if you had said those names 50 years ago, no one would have known what you were talking about. The library is, in fact, sort of a representation of that. It is a way of our saying the collective knowledge of the natural sciences is now brought together in a single place on the Princeton campus. You know, the treehouse, which is, a, I don't know where that name came from, but <laughs> that was originally the map room. And I think it still contains a lot of map cases. And the way the roof planes really hang out over the side of the building and create a kind of protective environment because it has these roofs that are cantilevered off the side of the building, kind of shade the ground around them, and then really connect the building to the trees, which is, I guess, where the treehouse idea came from. I love the atrium that comes through here and the, and the exploration of color, which is related to painting and to perception of the world around us. In particular, in this building, I was looking at Kandinsky. You know, his paintings have lots and lots of different colors, and the part that's the most interesting to me is the way the colors relate to each other. And then the most exciting part is then you finally paint the building. And a lot of really unexpected things start to happen because now you're dealing in full scale. There's a lot of daylight that comes into this building. And the colors start to bounce one off the other. It produces a whole different palette of colors that you, know, you weren't quite expecting. Two very different buildings two extreme visions. In very different ways, they embody an ideal of excellence, of doing things better than you did before. And in very different ways, they both encapsulate the deep-rooted ideals of Princeton as a university. They embody both the venerable traditions that provide links with its past, and the creativity and innovation with which it will lead us into the future. <laughs>